I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Ah, good morning. So I'm going to continue on my sexual biology series. Yeah, part seven, where I am discussing, um, well, mating systems, uh, fidelity, monogamy, polygamy, and such. Um, and it, with the first part of this, I talked about the particular case of a shrimp, um, which is thought to be exclusively monogamous. Um, but I wanted to make one part here, uh, this, this before I go on with more examples, um, uh, to define some terms. And I think it's important that I I define these terms, and I'll try to make it painless. I'll try to make it not, not so boring. But I want to make sure that when I use a term that you know what I mean when I say it, because um, some of these terms may have other meanings in different contexts. Um, so when you talk about sexual biology, the whole realm of sexual biology is split into two big categories, um, sexual systems and mating systems. Usually, the way this is defined is that a sexual system are those physical parameters that affect successful reproduction. Okay? Mating systems, on the other hand, are the social systems that affect reproduction. Okay? And I'll, I'll give some examples and talk about some categories within that in a bit. So talking about sexual systems, I made video about, uh, um, videos about uh, hermaphrodites. Hermaphroditism is a sexual system. The opposite of that, which is also a sexual system, is called gonochory which is when you have separate sexes throughout the lifetime of the animal. So when there's male and female, always male and female, that's gonochory. Um, and botanists use different terms for gonochory. Botanists use monoecious. Um, and for uh, hermaphrodites, they use dioecious. So two different words, um, same, same, roughly the same meanings. So um, that, that is one example of a sexual system. Another another functional aspect of sexual system, of a biological aspect that defines a sexual system, is what's called the operational sex ratio. Um, this is the number of males and females in a population, the ratio of male to female in a population, that will successfully, are capable of successfully reproducing. Um, remember, most, most things in life are born with a one-to-one -one sex ratio. 50% male, 50% female. However, that doesn't mean that there's going to be an equal number of males and females that are reproducing later on. Um, because what happens is you get things that will vary. Some, in some species, one-to-one -one ratio of male-female born, but males die at a higher rate than females. So by the time you reach sexual maturity, there's fewer males than females, or fewer females than males. Other things that can affect it are things like when you get extreme cases like harem keepers, um, I think elephant seals are a great example of that. An elephant seal, you know, the big, largest seal in the world, when they have offspring, it's 50% male, 50% female, one-to-one -one ratio. But once they reach sexual maturity, the only males that will successfully mate are the males that are able to beat out all of the other males and keep and maintain a harem, Okay. Her huge harem, uh, like over 200 females can be in a single harem, okay? With one male that has exclusive rights to mate with all of those females. The other, so what the, the average operational sex ratio in that species is, I believe, 1 to 50. That means that for every one male that's mating per re mating season, there's 49 other males that are not reproducing at all during that, re that season, okay? So, Still one to one sex ratio, operational sex ratio is one to fifty. So that's another that's the sexual system. Um, when we get to mating systems now, this is the social things that that regulate uh, reproduction, the social aspects of reproduction. So we get to mating systems. We get the big broad categories of them again are monogamy, which is um, reproducing with a single individual during a breeding season. Or polygamy, which is breeding with, reproducing with multiple individuals during a breeding season. Those terms are really fuzzy. And I'll talk about why they're fuzzy here in just a second. Um, one, of, you know, one of the sources of human sexual conflict is over monogamy. Number one reason couples break up, over monogamy. Problem is, is monogamy is really poorly defined. Um, because within monogamy, you've got two another broad categories, okay? You've got social monogamy and you've got sexual monogamy. 
social monogamy is when you partner with, work with, cooperate with, be seen with one individual throughout the breeding season. Okay, You're socially paired to an individual during the breeding season. Sexual monogamy is when you are sexually fidelitous to a single individual. That doesn't necessarily mean um, you don't mate with other individuals, but you only reproduce with another individual. Okay, so a species may a, a female and a species may promiscuously mate with whatever male comes along, but if she remains fidelitous to a single male, um, especially over multiple breeding seasons, then she's sexually fidel she's sexually monogamous. Um, unfortunately, optimally in species, sexual and social monogamy occur in the same pairs, but often that's not the case. You have birds that pair bond for life. When we do paternity testing on their, on the eggs or on the em on the offspring, we find that um, in in lots of cases, uh, exceeding 50% of the offspring aren't the males. They're not they're not the male of the pair that's raising the offspring. Um, similar studies in humans uh, worldwide have indicated that in at least some cases 10% of the offspring that, that on average a male is raising aren't his own in humans. So the point is, is that this, this infidelity in socially monogamous species is rampant. And uh, when you actually look at it from a biological standpoint, back to what I talked about, you know, the, the whole... Um, intersexual selection, the whole conflict between the sexes, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, the goal of a male is to put as many of his offspring in the next generation as possible, right? Successfully. So, for the male bird, having that pair female, paired with a female, you're helping her raise your chicks, you think you're, they're your chicks. At the same time, Fertilizing a few other females on the side may not be a bad thing in case something goes wrong with this clutch. You know you've got other offspring out there too. Other birds are raising as their own. So that's one, one thing. For a female, she might have a male bird that takes care of the, you know, great, builds a, builds a fine nest, uh, takes care of the chicks, brings lots of worms or whatever the case may be. Um, he's a great caregiver. However... He's not as bright, he's not as big, he's not as chirpy as this other male that you catch on the side here and there. So you may want his genes and your offspring, best of both worlds, being raised by the good caregiver. So that's another, that's a source of sexual conflict. And again, it applies to people too. So anyway, I hope these definitions weren't too slow, too boring. Um, I'll hopefully get to some of the more some of the more interesting examples and where these things uh you know, where, where we see this in the animal kingdom. So uh, talk to you later. Bye.